Hello again. We're going to be talking about developmental psychology or how humans develop over time. And this is kind of an interesting concept and actually one of my favorite classes from graduate school, even though I was an industrial organizational psychologist, I had the pleasure of uh, taking a graduate seminar with uh, Jeffrey Lockman, who's a developmental psychologist. And uh, he uh, talked a lot about, um, you know, how uh, cognitive development changes with different stages. So we're talking about Piaget, uh, which I'm sure uh, Dr. Lockman would do a much better job explaining than I will. Um, but let's start at the beginning. Um, your book emphasizes this nature-nurture debate, uh, which I like to mention again. You know, it's basically the idea that we have this genetic and predisposed um, biological information, and then we have the environmental sort of interactions that we have. Um, so we'll be talking about some studies on that um, and the influence of those. Uh, but it's also important to say that this is the process over time, right? So it's not just a static uh, impact of the genes. As we said in the last lecture, the genes interact with your environment and even select your environments in part. Um, but it's the back and forth of that, uh, as we'll describe later with child development, that sort of makes you mature and grow over time. And as you mature and grow, your abilities to decipher the world change, um, as with the stages of kind of development we're talking about with Piaget. Uh, basically, they all sort of argue uh, in development, uh, at least at this stage, that you know early experiences are becoming um, uh, you know critical to our understanding of the world and our interactions with it. Right. So the idea that um, you know, your later personality and cognitive abilities and development um, largely depend on um, your support, nurturance, all of that. Um, you know, with ducks, we talk about imprinting, but there's a lot of things can, that can be imprinted on you, um, not just a maternal face or voice, as we'll talk about, but um, all sorts of things can be imprinted, um, especially during what they call that critical period, that early period um, that is important for not just associations with parental figures, maybe uh, in the animal uh, world and in ours, um, but also the later anxieties and personalities that develop um, based on those critical period experiences. Some of this was studied by Harry and Margaret Harlow, um, some of their uh, famous or infamous, I might want to say, uh, monkey studies, where they were looking at early experiences with mothers uh, or the lack thereof on monkey behavior. And most notably, the sort of wire mother with the bottle versus the cloth mother that was seen as more comforting. Um, and interactions with uh, the monkey with maybe a you know, noisy little, I think it was a toy robot, if I remember the video, uh, that would make noise and the, mother, or the monkey would run to the cloth mother rather than the wire mother. And they would see differences based on how monkeys even uh, defended itself, if there was a mother uh, present or not. Um, of course, monkeys that had a lot of deprivation uh, early on, uh, social deprivation specifically, uh, they couldn't really relate to other monkeys, um, and they couldn't uh, necessarily uh, uh, reproduce with monkeys. They didn't understand any of that. Um, so there are some interesting results of it, although the studies were found to be largely unethical uh, and you know maybe limited in terms of the implications because uh, there could be a lot of explanations for what's going on in those cages. At least that's what people think now. This sort of is similar to some of the more modern, uh, you know, incarnations of this, like the strange situation where they would use human children and put them in a room to see how, you know, they would relate to strangers who would come in um, or other changes to their situation uh, based on the presence, absence of their mother and that sort of thing. So this all is, you know, all these different types of avoidant, uh, anxious, ambivalent, all of those different types are types of attachment, right? Um, and those are related to your temperament, temperament being your sort of personality. Um, and so the personality in this case is your, your interaction with the environment based on your attachment to your sort of parental figures. Uh, so that's very similar to the monkey studies when you think about it. Taking a step back, you know, maturation and development happens over the course of our lives, starting as a fetus, you know, um, based on some sort of, you know, uh, outside interventions, you know, that can change the way we later can interact with the world, like with fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, that early induction of alcohol can uh, 
sort of affect those neurons, right? Those neurodevelopment, uh, the nerves and neurons are being built in. Um, so those neurotransmit, in this case, glutamate, a neurotransmitter called glutamate, um, is not produced enough, I believe, and that uh, you know affects the growth of neurons. And then later on, they have cognitive difficulties. Uh, moving on to the neonatal wheel, once you're born, of course, we have certain abilities and reflexes, um, but you know we can see a little bit, I think, um, bas basically lights, light and not light, I think, and pretty soon we start to start to um, uh, you know feel things emotionally, um, but not in complex ways, of course. So happy, sad, you know, uh, satiation, and that rooting, uh, rooting for food, basically, uh, like a little mouse or something. As one of our major sort of motivations or instincts. So infancy, once you go past that sort of baby stage, um, that's when we really start to get going with sort of uh, you know cognitive development. My favorite being probably the object permanence idea of you know playing peekaboo. The reason babies uh, get surprised or laugh when you play peekaboo with them is they really think you disappear. Um, so that idea of things being there when you can see them and not being there when you can't see them um, is not developed yet. Those those connections haven't been figured out yet. Um, so that's really cute to play peekaboo once you really understand that. Um, this is also when they start looking at attachment, you know, the sort of attachment styles uh, based on parent-child interactions. Um, there's, I don't think, enough research looking at father's attachment here. Um, there's a lot that we know about how babies, you know, can be securely or insecurely attached to mothers and how that affects them later on. Um, we also start to look at faces, especially unique faces. So babies tend to focus on people with beards, for example. Um, babies love staring at uh, my face because it's very uh, bearded and weird. Anyways, uh, another thing that's starting to develop around this stage is learning and memory, right? So. Uh, Really young infants uh, are affected by sounds, which is really cool, especially their mother's voice because they've heard it uh, in utero for so long. Um, so they'll turn towards it, they'll recognize it, which is uh, which is pretty cool. And they can start to be trained a little bit in terms of like sort of um, response reaction sorts of things. Um, like, you know, uh, if they look at their toes and giggle, they'll do that again, right? They'll remember that that's fun to look at their toes. <laughs> Uh, Jean Piaget is one of the most famous psychologists in this area. Uh, he kind of came up with this uh, sort of stage theory, as we call them, where there's different uh, levels to development. Uh, and he, he kind of came up with this basically because he was looking at intelligence. And he didn't think intelligence was uh, the answer to everything. He thought, you know, uh, looking at children, I think he was in France, looking at language uh, intelligence tests, uh, looking at how language differences and responses of children uh, would maybe inform him differently than the answer, right? Um, so he started talking about schemas, you know, how we see the world and how we uh, basically accommodate or assimilate information into our minds based on interacting with the world um, or how things fit into that schema or not, right? So if we have a schema of the world and we learn new things, we assimilate them and that's a very low uh, effort sort of thing. However, when things don't fit with our worldview, um, you know, maybe we meet somebody from another political party and get along with them, and that doesn't fit with our worldview. We have to accommodate. We have to change our worldview a little bit and think, oh, okay, well, maybe not everybody from that political party is, um, you know, a wackadoo uh, or whatever. So, uh, you know, that's a little bit more difficult for us to do. Uh, but Piaget said that as we grow and mature, we assimilate and accommodate um, to sort of reach what he calls this equilibrium sort of state. Um, and, you know, that's sort of the rest that our world makes sense, right? When you're at equilibrium, the world makes sense. Um, but when we get new information, we either assimilate it. Um, so learning a new friend's name, that's not very difficult. Uh, you just assimilate a new name into your name bank in your brain. Um, but accommodation maybe is, you know, learning uh, a new alien name. Uh, um, like literally someone lands from another planet and you have to... Uh, you know, learn how to be friends with them, which would be very different maybe than a human, and, you know, say their weird uh, Martian uh, name. Um, and if you think of the middle ground of this, just learning people from different cultures, it's somewhere in the middle, right? So it's not exactly assimilation. You may have to accommodate those um, new types of people into your life. Anyways, the stages that Jean Piaget uh, 
really thought were the, the four major ones were the sensory motor, the pre-operational, concrete, and formal operations. Um, he argued that not everybody maybe made it to the formal operations, um, but that's sort of the most abstract stage of you know separating us from the world and knowing that other people have feelings and emotions, um, and we sort of uh, grow uh, cognitively and can do more complex things cognitively uh, as we move through these stages, right? So the first one being the two to seven early childhood after we get out of you know sort of the baby years, and this is where children start to sort of first cognitively develop, you know. Um, they reach that pre op. This is what John Piaget called the pre operational stage, right? Um, so they're very much, uh, you know, egocentric. They're, you know, uh, the center of their world. Uh, you know, they believe trees and animals uh, maybe have thoughts and emotions, um, maybe more so uh, than the average person. Uh, I live in California, remember, so I think that's already, uh, I think that's a formal operations thing, too. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, we start to develop not just, you know, cognitively, but also uh, emotionally and with our, you know, play with our partners, right? So the idea of parallel play where I'm doing my puzzle and you're doing your puzzle to uh, we're both doing a puzzle together starts to develop here. That sort of social uh, interaction uh, is sort of the goal here, really. Uh, then you move on to what the concrete operational stages, which is middle childhood. So, you know, around 10 years old, around fourth, fifth grade, right? And this is where children start to realize how they compare to those peers that they start to play with. Um, they start to get away from their own sort of um, center, center and start to have true relationships with peers. Um, they form cliques. So if you remember, you know, fourth and fifth grade, it's very probably important to get along and, you know, have friends um, and that sort of thing. I think that's the major plot line of Stranger Things other than all the monsters. Um, but it's, you know, sort of the idea of who am I as a person, right? Uh, then when you get to the formal operation stage, which is really in adolescence, um, you start to really get the idea of abstractions, right? So there's um, books you start to read that, you know, really um, help you develop as a person. You start to think of, you know, philosophies and ideologies. Um, you're still sort of the uh, center of your own story, right? So this personal fable idea is one of my favorite ideas here where, um, you know, you're the sort of the Harry Potter of your um, story. Um, people tend to grow out of that, um, but it's very common, especially in early adolescence. Um, anyways, uh, socially, you know, emotionally, uh, of course, at this stage, there's sort of the, the distancing from parent relationships. So those conflicts start to emerge, which a lot of evolutionary psychologists claim is a good thing. That's sort of the pushing the baby bird out of the nest idea that we do to ourselves. We're starting to create conflict so that we do move on. Um, but, you know, of course, also the hormone biological changes cause mood changes and the brain development leads to a host of potential risky behaviors uh, as listed there that I won't go through. But, um, you know, to bring the biology into this a little bit, the frontal you know, lobe is uh, related to a lot of this. So women's develops around 18, 19, uh, for the most part, men, it's late 20s, their frontal lobe is fully developed. Um, so a lot of these risky behaviors um, are still uh, at play during those college years for you guys. Anyways, uh, another interesting part of this adolescence that are developed is the identity crisis that happens. So, you know, who am I? Where am I going? Uh, do I know who I am? Do you have that identity achievement? Um, or have you, you know, uh, maybe not even thought about who you are and you haven't explored who you are? Um, you maybe have that diffusion idea that there's, there's, you haven't thought about it and you're not sure who you are or who you want to be, right? I, I like the box that's the identity foreclosure. Um, I feel like that half the time where uh, maybe you explore the issue uh, or not, but you're pretty sure you don't know who you are. Um, that's sort of an interesting concept, but anyways, it's just the idea that you're trying to figure out, uh, you know, are you good? Are you bad? Uh, this is the uh, root of a lot of superhero comics. I think, um, I do a little bit of comic book research and, you know, the personalities and identities and even the uh, jobs and mental health of comic book superheroes mimics a lot of what we see in our world, um, which is interesting. Anyways. Um, you know, some of this also plays into how our parents treat us, right? I think a lot of us, especially at the adolescent stage, are really concerned with um, how our parents give us freedom or uh, the lack thereof. Um, so some researchers really look at parenting styles like the ones listed here 
um, you know, the indifferent involve used to be called more the sort of laissez-faire, right? Um, uh, and that's sort of been, you know, a little bit separated now. Laissez-faire is a little bit permissive, a little bit indifferent. Um, authoritative and authoritarian are the more strict, right? Um, with authoritarian usually leading to the uh, worst outcomes for children, along with sometimes the laissez-faire sort of styles. But, you know, this is a back and forth uh, thing. And one of my favorite quotes I've heard is, uh, it's not that you can change necessarily the parenting style or your parent, it's you only can change your reaction to them. Um, this is a back and forth process. And of course, uh, the stress that comes with it or the distancing is sort of the negative outcome. So it's good to limit that in some way if possible. You know, once you're moving into adulthood, uh, you know, this is, let's say, you know, when you're getting around like 40, um, you know, middle age, 40 to 50 is when the eyesight and other physical processes start to decline. Um, you know, I think even bone marrow production starts to go down. Um, and of course, uh, things like cognitive abilities, you know, sort of crystallized intelligence doesn't change necessarily what you know, but uh, how you can change your mind or how you can re-envision concepts, or what we might call fluid intelligence, uh, tends to get less, uh, um, less strong. Uh, around middle age and declines, therefore. Um, so it's kind of the idea that uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. It's more uh, we can't change an old dog's mind, if you will. Some other uh, emotional and social issues that come around adulthood, uh, you know, some things tend to get muted. Uh, so they say gender differences are muted, um, but other dimensions don't really change too much. So once you get to be about 11, actually, uh, 11 years old, your personality is pretty stable. Um, once you get to be, you know, 50 or 60, uh, not much is going to change. But um, some things, you know, based on hormones, uh, like agreeableness, aggression, uh, things like that tend to, you know, uh, lessen the gender differences or the, the lack of those uh, chemicals uh, flowing through the bloodstream stop creating such differences that exist between genders at earlier ages. Anyways, you also start thinking about, okay, what am I doing with my job? You know, the midlife transition is sometimes a midlife crisis. Um, so maybe new goals or, um, you know, reassessing goals happens. And, you know, this is where maybe people uh, end up at the last minute. Maybe, okay, maybe I should have children. Maybe I should change my careers or buy that Ferrari uh, tends to take over, right? You know, towards the end of life, of course, uh, is an important sort of transition for us. And a lot of developmental psychologists tend to focus on the early ages, but um, there's a lot of research starting in, you know, sort of longevity issues, um, things like Alzheimer's and mental deficits that happen with age. Um, and a lot of that is related to, you know, the biology, uh, your health, um, genetics, all sorts of stuff. So uh, the intake of food, the uh, toxic chemicals you're exposed to, as well as your genetic predispositions uh, toward health um, in terms of behaviors and your physical attributes, right? So you could inherit a, uh, a bone disease potentially that limits your ability to, uh, to produce bone marrow and that could limit your lifespan. Um, where it could be more psychological, the stress you feel, um, other sorts of things that produce uh, maybe negative uh, emotions uh, those tend to be correlated with, you know, lower lifespans, uh, especially if you're in dangerous occupations and stressed because then accidents happen. Some researchers like Elizabeth Kubler-Ross uh, look at sort of the, the death and dying stages at one of the Western Psychological Association conferences a few years ago. I remember uh, death and what's called death salience being very popular. Um, so that's sort of the idea of um, death, right? Um, she looked specifically at people who may be dying um, and sort of the stages people go through, right? So uh, describes as the denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance of death stages um, when dealing with that. And that can happen at any age. I think most people would go through those similar steps, even though like stage theories of development, not everybody goes through each one or goes through them uh, for the same amount of time, right? Finally, you know, those uh, towards the last stage uh, of, of life can go through, you know, ego identity or, um, you know, sort of confusion of what their ego or self is, um, or maybe feel despair for maybe not accomplishing or not attempting to accomplish certain things. But 
Um, a lot of the research shows that that's related to earlier stages of life. Um, so it really argues to uh, have fun now <laughs> or you may regret it later on. Um, some of the sort of more positive psychology uh, advice we see from the literature, um, one of the theories called terror management theory, uh, argues that we cope with fear by avoiding the thoughts um, and promoting sort of this positive psychological view of, you know, self-esteem and humanistic goals of hope and, you know, uh, your values and how you've attained those values. Um, so that's sort of managing the terror of um, end of life, if you will. Anyways, development's an interesting concept. Um, I encourage you also to go Google some videos on, you know, the uh, um, object permanence uh, concept we talked about, or what's called the false cliff uh, with developmental psychology, watching babies um, uh, either not realize they're walking over a cliff or realizing that, they're, um, that they see the visual cliff. Anyways, some funny stuff. I uh, hope you had a good lecture, and don't remember... Don't forget, I should say, the midterm is after uh, lecture five. So after these, you're free to take the midterm.